Humans are constantly trying to come up with novel solutions to complicated problems. And in the short amount of time that we've been around, we haven't been doing so bad. But someone, or something, has been around a lot longer than us, and we could probably afford to take a few cues from them. I am of course talking about evolution, the iterative process that has been running since the dawn of time. It refines, remakes, remixes, and recreates different biological mechanisms to suit different ecological niches. That's the theory and basis behind biomimicry, a field that tries to adapt what nature has already made into our own engineering efforts. But what does that really mean? How can we adapt what Mother Nature has spent billions of years piecing together? Well, before we write our own take on what she's already written, we have to study her source material. Luckily, some of it is sticking to my pants right now. These are burrs. If you've ever been hiking through the woods or walking through your local park and you come home with your lower half covered in these spiky things, well, now you know. They come in many different shapes and sizes, but they're usually a small ball shape with visible spikes. Each one needs to be tediously pulled off. You can't just brush them away. But what are they exactly? The burrs themselves are either a whole fruit or just the seed of a plant, but why do they stick to you? Well, it's a form of seed dispersal. A passing animal will come by and get a burr or two or twenty snagged in its fur. Sometime later, these little hitchhikers will fall off. The whole seed or the seed within the fruit will then sprout in its new home. It's an incredible way to propagate. So that answers the why. What about the how? As in, how exactly were those burrs sticking to me in the first place? Well, that's exactly what a guy named George de Mistral wondered in 1941 when he was out on a hunting trip with his dog Milka. They both got absolutely covered in burrs, and George, being a science man all day long, wanted to figure out how they worked. So he took some home. What he found were tiny hooks covering the bird that latch onto whatever they can get a hold of. He wondered, what if we use something like this instead of buttons, zippers, really anything the clothing industry uses that keeps things together? Well, he spent nearly 10 years trying to answer that question. It took him a long time to synthetically reproduce the hooking mechanism that burrs use, but he eventually succeeded. And can you guess what he made? It's Velcro. By weaving nylon and cotton together and doing some very precise cutting at specific angles, George found that you could create a set of hooks on one side and loops on the other. This is what ultimately makes Velcro, and I don't think I need to tell you that it's incredibly useful. Used by astronauts, the military, clothing manufacturers, this stuff is everywhere. Velcro is without a doubt one of the biggest advances in the niche of inventions that make things stick together. But bigger innovations may be on the horizon, and to find those, we need to go that way. Velcro is definitely a game changer in the fabric industry, but one environment we've always struggled to use adhesives in is underwater. In fact, most adhesives need dry surfaces in order to work. Why is that? It's because surface molecules would rather bond with water than just about anything else. Once water grips the surface of an object, any adhesives there lose their place. This is why surgeons use stitches instead of glue. Scientists and engineers have for a long time been trying to come up with an adhesive that would work reliably underwater. Evolution has once again beaten us to the punch though. These are what I believe to be blue mussels. Mussels have solved the underwater sticking problem. There are three main components to how they've achieved this, and it all comes together in its beard or byssus complex. The byssus complex is composed of byssus threads. These threads are created by what's known as the muscle's foot, though it looks more like a tongue. The muscle uses its foot like a plunger to create a vacuum on whatever surface it wants to stick to. The foot then squirts out various liquid proteins that come together and harden into an adhesive. That's how the main line of the thread is created. Sitting at its end is a small solid foam disc that acts as its anchor. It's called a plaque, and it's made up of a different set of proteins than the rest of the thread. These proteins, when released, thicken to the consistency of shaving cream and harden into a solid foam containing air bubbles. The muscle then secretes a mucus-like substance over the thread and plaque that allows them to separate from their mold. It then removes its foot and voila, do that enough times and you have a byssus complex. So why is this system the ultimate underwater adhesive? 
Well, each of the three components, the thread line, the plaque, and the mucus-like sealant, each come together to make a whole greater than the sum of their parts. The core component of the protein molecules in the thread are made up of collagen, the same stuff you can find in our tendons. Aside from collagen, each molecule is accompanied by a separate portion that is either very rigid or very bouncy. The springier molecules are concentrated near the muscle, and as you move down to the plaque, the molecules are made up of more stiffer pieces. This gradient from soft to hard allows the thread to be both incredibly tough while remaining elastic. The plaque sitting at its end isn't very rigid either because it's a foam, it's able to deform. But why do muscles care whether their beards are flexible or not? Well, it's pretty common for them to occupy the intertidal zone of the seashore. That's the area above water at low tide and below water at high tide. A lot of the surfaces that they'll cling to can expand and contract throughout the day as they fluctuate from being in the open sun to cold seawater. The plaque can deform to accommodate that change in size throughout the day. It can only do that because of its flexibility, an inflexible material would just fall right off. But even if the plaque was to break a little, it's filled with tiny holes. It's a foam. That design means that if the foam disc begins to crack, that fracture will stop when it encounters a void of empty space. The hollows act as a buffer for these breaks. We actually do know how to do this. A deformable solid structure with holes inside is basically what styrofoam is. The difference between the muscle's plaque and our styrofoam is that the muscle doesn't need to use CFCs or carcinogens in order to make its foam. CFC stands for chlorofluorocarbons, gases that tear up our ozone layer when they get released into our atmosphere. Speaking of sustainability, the mucus-like sealant that coats the thread and the plaque is also eco-friendly. The muscle only uses the whole byssus for a limited amount of time. When it's ready to move on, it will just leave it behind. Give it two or three years and that mucus-like sealant will fall apart and microbes will come and eat the rest up. That may not sound impressive, but petroleum-based substances that we make, like styrofoam are not biodegradable. We build materials with disposability in mind, but that last a lot longer than the people that use them. Biodegradable, tough, and elastic. The material design of the byssus complex is incredible. It reminds me of another sticky substance, spider webs. Five times stronger than steel and 30% more elastic than our stretchiest nylon, spider silk is an engineering marvel. This combination of being super strong and super flexible is super useful. A material with these properties could be used for artificial ligaments, suspension bridge cables, and bulletproof fabric. Speaking of bulletproof, spider silk can withstand five times the forceful impact of Kevlar, the material we currently use in bulletproof vests. Now, while spider silk is obviously totally fine for the environment, Kevlar is not. It requires crazy high temperatures and pressures and petroleum to get made, which end up making a ton of toxic byproducts. Ah, I see a pattern here. In contrast, spider silk requires no drilling for oil, no crazy high temperatures or pressure, and no toxic byproducts. It starts as a raw liquid protein sloshing around inside of the spider. Just before the liquid reaches one of its spinnerets, the little nozzles that the silk comes out of, it goes through a liquid crystal phase, a state of matter halfway between liquid and crystal. It then emerges as an insoluble, nearly waterproof, highly ordered fiber. Scientists have been trying for decades to create a synthetic spider silk in the lab with limited success. Producing a super strong, tough, elastic substance with no environmental impact and without extreme conditions is incredibly difficult. And yet Peter Parker figured it out when he was 15, in his underwear no less. Weird. Let's keep moving. I've been pretty lucky so far. All of the webs have been off to the side, so no face full of silk for me just yet. But I'm sure you know that's not always the case. You know, you're just walking around and then bam, it's all over you. Why is that? Why do spiders always seem to put their webs in the most inconvenient places? Spiders do actually go out of their way to make sure that their webs catch only what they can eat. Inside of their silk are strands that reflect UV light. Now, while you and I can't see UV light, birds can, so they have no problem avoiding spider webs. Believe me when I say that spiders don't want anything tearing down their webs any more than you don't want to walk into them. But all right, big whoop. So birds don't fly into spider webs because they reflect UV light. Why is that a big deal, and why did I come into the city? 
Well, it's because I stand among what very well could be the world's greatest bird killer, glass. I'm not being hyperbolic here. The Smithsonian estimates that anywhere from 365 million to 1 billion birds are killed each year by glass collisions in the US alone. I mean, think about it. You're flying in the air and you see giant blue sky all around you. How are you supposed to distinguish between it and the reflection on a building? In the best case scenario, the bird will collide with the window and be stunned for a bit before flying away. However, death is unfortunately a pretty frequent occurrence in these cases. But it doesn't have to be. What if we incorporated what we know about spider webs and their UV reflecting properties into the glass that we make? Doing so would mean that birds could see the window as a window instead of a transparent surface or an extension of the sky. Well, a group of engineers did just that by creating a product called Ornolux. It's glass with a pattern that appears by reflecting UV light so that birds can see it while remaining virtually invisible to us. This is a big deal. With enough adoption, we could see those huge mortality figures I mentioned earlier plummet. Biomimicry can help us achieve great things not only for animals, but the environment we share with them. It also provides a direct benefit to us. Biomimicry can be a foundation and a model that we use to engineer more effective and sustainable products. Whether you need to make something semi-invisible, strong, flexible, sticky, waterproof, or all of the above, I highly suggest you check whether Mother Nature has already created a blueprint for it. She makes lots and patents nothing at all. Till next time.